to also the secondary issue, um, identify the channel and your positioning strategy and how you're going to reach that target market that we'll identify later in our presentation. So we've uh, outlined a few factors of, um, con consider factors that we, <laughs> that we um, looked at as we prepared a recommendation for you today. So you've been around since 1969, you have a strong rad history. Obviously, it's really competitive with Pepsi and Coke as your main competitors. They are taking 90% of the industry right now. So we have within that 10%, we want to be the substantial player in that 10% in the niche market. And also, it's $10,000 to bring back one flavor. So we're going to outline that cost later on in our presentation. Um, since the 70s and 80s, there's been some substantial differences in the marketplace. So for one, um, consumers are more health conscious. Um, there's a phasing out of glass. Consumers are using the no-sort recycling bins, so that's something to consider. They're not going to be bringing back the glass bottles to you anymore. So, And also, there's the potential of going online with e-commerce. So I pulled this um, stat chart. So as you can see, it's from 2006, but it's the most relevant um, recent um, industry. So the carbonated soft drink industry is substantial and it's profitable. So it's a go in terms of that. So our best recommendation for you with the um, Pop Shop brand is to recapture that old market, position it on nostalgia. Um, so those 70s, from the 70s and 80s, that past um, market, bring them back and they enjoyed that brand, so uh, we think that they'd love to come back and be your primary market again. And then we're going to use specialty um, retailers and restaurants and use a, a various um, promotional techniques that we'll go to in further detail. So in terms of uh, agenda today, we're going to go through the target market, positioning, um, how we're going to get that product out there and how you're going to do that and make your brand number one again. And then I'll pass it off to Nicole. Thank you, Megan. So as Megan just explained, we have a lot of information to get to today. So what we're basically going to do is break down the recommendation, go into detail about what each aspect entails, and really explain why this is the right choice for your organization at this time. And we're going to begin with the target market, because this is in essence the most important decision. From this, everything from your positioning to your promotions will derive from this target market. In this case, after analyzing the pop shop brand and the current market conditions, we determined that you should target your former consumers who have now grown up and spanned an age range of approximately 40 to 55, give or take a few years. This will allow you to capitalize on your former history and these consumers' fond memory of your brand, while also indirectly serving a secondary market, these consumers' children. So, we went to a little bit more detail and developed a living profile to really explain why this target market is the most viable option for your organization. Now, the best reason is that they do already have those fond memories of your brand. And we are currently seeing a trend where these consumers are experiencing an increase in desire for products from their youth, for these nostalgic products. Due to their age and their life stage, they also have many characteristics that will benefit your brand. For instance, they're not price sensitive, which is very important because you're entering a competitive market where each cent will greatly impact your margin. So this will definitely benefit you moving forward. They also control household spending. So this means they have great control and influence over the products used by your secondary market. So by targeting these aging consumers, you can effectively serve both markets, which would not necessarily work the other way around. Now another reason we picked this market, rather than a younger demographic, is that they don't exhibit much brand loyalty. So we won't be entering the market trying to take consumers away that are already loyal to the major brands like Coke and Pepsi. And as you move forward, this will help, help you capture more of your target market. So, uh, to serve these aging consumers, we're recommending a differentiation strategy to really capture this niche market. So, capitalize on your brand's history and position it using a nostalgic appeal. In order to do this, we're recommending that you keep the former label and the general shape of the pop shop products. 
We've also created a series of advertisements that I'll explain in a little bit, uh, which take their theme from the 60s and 70s and really highlight the reintroduction of a brand that these people used to love. Now the reason that we've picked this positioning is because as I said, there's a trend. There's an increase in desire for, uh, an increase in desire for these nostalgic products. So this will resonate very strongly with these consumers and capitalize on this trend. It will also allow you to, uh, to charge a premium pricing strategy because this will be positioning the product as an indulgent and a wistful product. So consumers will be willing to pay more for it than an everyday cola because they get the added emotional benefits of re-experiencing fond memories from their past. It will also differentiate you from Coke and Pepsi. So as you grow and you're ready to take on these market leaders head to head, you will have a distinct and different offering. So, to serve these consumers, we're recommending that you start out small when initially launching the brand, just to mitigate any unnecessary risks. So, we'll begin with launching four primary flavors. This will avoid unnecessary costs, and it will also whet consumers' appetites. So as you grow, they'll begin asking for more and more flavors. But at this time, you'll have the necessary returns to reinvest into development of these other flavors. So these four flavors, we recommend we serve to consumers in two ways. The first is a regular 12-ounce bottle, which looks very similar to the former Pop Shop products, and a new twist on an 8-ounce on-the-go stubby bottle. Now this bottle has multiple benefits. This will entice your consumers to buy it for their children, for snacks or for their lunch boxes, and so you can then start serving your secondary market through this bottle. But it also re represents a new uh, opportunity for these aging consumers who can see it as a sample size, but maybe the 12 ounce might be too big for them to finish. So the only major change we're recommending is um, a switch from glass to plastic, because this is cost saving, which is very important in the startup stage of this venture. It will save on manufacturing costs, shipping, and freight quality great costs. Because as Megan said, there's now home recycling bins where they can just be picked up from their home. So the opportunity for them to bring the products back to the pop shop retail locations are over. So you can no longer save money by reusing your original material in this matter. But plastic also represents the, represents the opportunity to explore biodegradable material, which can reduce your car footprint and really build some goodwill among these consumers who already associate pop shop as a recycling friendly product. We are also recommending that in the future, you explore partnering with a vodka company to create pop shop coolers. Now the basis for this is research that states that your target market is the biggest purchasers of alcohol in North America. So this will really serve them well. It will also help you serve your secondary market as they move from adolescence into adulthood. So now Megan's going to explain exactly what retailers you should try to get shelf based on and how to distribute these products. So in terms of how we're going to get our product out there, we'll be utilizing a poll strategy. Um, we'll be placing um, the product, we'll be um, forming relationships with um, private retailers and candy shops like um, they'll be private and they won't be chains because we find that the chains, like if we're to go with a Boston pizza, um, they're using the syrups um, for their pop. So we will be looking into small diners, 60s diners, and we have pictures up there. Something that's fun, that best represents the brand. In terms of Saskatoon location, it would be like the Broadway Cafe, where they, or these small other Broadway cafes that do the um, individual sale of cans and pops. And we'll be utilizing the regional sales reps because we find that this is a more effective way than doing a, a large distribution sale. And also, initially, in terms of location, we'll be just utilizing um, Ontario because we don't have the manpower just yet to go all across Canada, but that's definitely in the long term. So in terms of a chain that would be a possible avenue for um, partnering with is The Works. It's a, it's a fun burger place in Ontario, very hugely popular. They're looking to expand all across Canada. So forming a partnership with them now, and as they expand, it would be a great way to take a pop shop brand across Canada. Another one would be um, the Marble Slab Creamery. So summertime, pop and ice cream, fun combo. So that's a method that we think would be a viable option for taking the pop shop brand across Canada. And in terms of why we chose the regional sales trip over the distributor, so I prepared a budget. So um, industry average $17 an hour for the wage. Um, we're, it's going to be a part-time regional sales rep, but I've prepared the budget on a three-month full-time because um, it's hard to guess um, because managers in the restaurants and the stores will be 
primarily in the, in the office between 1 and 3 p.m., and that would be the prime time to go in. So we thought that just under $10,000 um, is a good representative of how much a part-time sales rep would be. So they would be go out, going out and making that connection to those retails, retailers that you've investigated. And whereas a distributor, um, an industry average is about 25% that they would take of your sales revenue. So if the product was sold at $1, and if it's, we guess that it would be possible to make $200 worth of sale at each retailer. If we um, work with 100 retailers, that's $20,000. So as you can see, the differential between a distributor and the, the rep is $50,000. Now that can pay um, for your whole marketing budget. So that's something to consider. So now we'll go over how we will market. Thank you, me. So we are recommending, when you initially launch, to use four very cost-saving promotional techniques. Now the first one is a traditional in-store window display. So when consumers are walking down urban Ontario, they can see the big pop shop ban banners and candy stores and be enticed to go inside and try out this product they've been missing for all these years. The second one is uh, tri-fold table placements in the themed restaurants. So when patrons sit down to order, they're aware of the product's availability and they'll be enticed to order it. Uh, we're also recommending a guerrilla campaign. It'll work very well since we're saying that you should stay in urban Ontario. It'll be very easy to implement these cost-effective non-traditional techniques as well. We also think that moving forward, you should explore the opportunity to go to business schools and talk to their marketing students about a potential competition where they can create a viral Twitter or YouTube campaign for you. Because this would give you an abundance of marketing material at very low development costs. We also believe that utilizing Facebook for an advertisement and a page would work very well because it has great reach and frequency for low cost. And your uh, primary target market is currently exploring the world of Facebook. So just to uh, kind of help explain what we're intended with these promotions, we came up with a few uh, working examples. They're definitely not in final form. But uh, these two here are examples of what a few window displays could look like. As you see, they really reinforce the positioning and they look and they feel like posters from the 60s and 70s. So this is resonate well with the target market. We also think for potential guerrilla campaigns, you could get a serving team dressed up in 70s or 60s gear with a Volkswagen Beetle with peace signs on it and get them serving samples in downtown Toronto or other urban, or, uh, urban areas in Ontario. Or, as you can see behind me, you could turn a mall escalator into a retro psychedelic pop shop product. So consumers could ride up on the fizz of the pop as they do their shopping. So now Megan's going to go over the comprehensive implementation plan that we've prepared for all these recommendations. Thank you. So we've broken it down into three phases. So the short term, for zero to six months, um, we recommend that you go and form a relationship with a bottler. Now that, that relationship will sustain your business and as you expand, that's, it's a primary and it's a huge, huge thing that you have to work out um, right from the get-go. And then to set up a Facebook page, so as the promotions will later come out, um, they'll be able to go back to that Facebook page and type it in, and as everybody's on and using social media, it's a free way of getting your product out there. And then, as Nicole was saying, pick four flavors and develop them. Um, begin creating promotional um, materials for the, so the signage and the tabletops for the restaurants. Um, start hiring staff that you can um, rely upon and have them right from inception so that they will help you grow your brand. Now in the midterm from 7 to 12 months, investigate these market retailers. So go out and find these small um, restaurants and candy shops that would serve your product and represent your brand to the best that you would like. And then hire your part-time sales reps um, and then um, they will be used as you later formate your logistics network and so you have to develop whether they will be delivering the product or if your retailers would prefer to come in and pick it up. And then, as well, start um, identifying business schools that would like to take part in your guerrilla marketing strategy. And Nicole, um, we think that a $5,000 grand prize for this Twitter challenge would be a great amount and I'll go into that in my budget. And it's a great incentive for students to become involved with a, with a brand. And so in the long term, um, look outside Ontario. So um, we're going to um, push the product in Ontario in, a, in the beginning, but we want to expand that and get the brand out there. And then look at those real, real um, those chains, so the works and the creamery, and see if they will be willing to take on your brand. Um, look at the new flavors. So those the new flavors, the launch of those can be used for your promotional materials and other guerrilla marketing techniques. 
And then also, as Nicole had said, um, in terms of sampling, going out into Toronto um, or Oshega in Quebec, a great way to access a large market and your target market as well. So in terms of a budget, um, how Facebook works, it's a, it's a per click basis. So we recommend that you put a $50 cap per day um, on your Facebook advertisements. So as people click, um, Facebook will keep um, tabs on that. And so that would be approximately $18,000 for the year, which seems like a large amount, but considering Facebook is the way of accessing the most amount of people in Canada, it's definitely, it should happen within the first year to get that um, recognition of your brand um, up there again. And then the signage, about $1,300 for print and design, so just under $20,000. And then um, possibilities, as we had mentioned, around $5,000 for um, sampling. And then the $5,000 Twitter grand prize that we would, or it can be lowered, but we think $5,000 would attract the most following. Now, Nicole, I've got some risks for you. Thank you. So, of course, with any business venture, there are risks. And we've identified two major ones that we think you might have to contend with over the next uh, year or so. But we've also come up with a few strategies to help mitigate these risks. Now, the biggest risk is that you will be unable to capture the primary target market. So to prevent this from happening, we recommend that you initially try increasing your promotional efforts because this could be due just perhaps to a lack of awareness among the consumers. Maybe we haven't done our best to reach them yet. But if you continue to see uh, a lack of sales among this target market, consider serving your secondary target market directly because, of course, the younger demographic are big purchasers of these indulgent cola kind of products. You can also utilize your regional sales rep in a slightly unorthodox method because, as Megan said, they will have close relationships and repertoires with the retailers. So you can get them to kind of fill out the retailers and uh, search for a little bit of primary research there. So get some feedback on who's buying the products and how they're reacting to them. And then make necessary adjustments based on this information. Now a second cost that every organization may have to contend with is escalating costs. If costs rise out of control and destroy your margins. So to combat this, we recommend that you search out perhaps a distributor. As Megan said, the regional sales rep are cheaper at this time because we're recommending you stay in a very localized area. But as you expand across Canada, hiring more and more sales reps to contend with the larger area may actually reduce the cost difference between the two, and a distributor could be the most viable option at that time. Or you could uh, renegotiate with your manufacturer, see if they can offer you any deals, or perhaps explore relationships with a new bottler to see if they have any cost-saving techniques you can utilize. So. That concludes our presentation today. You came to us asking what to do with the Pop Shop brand, and we're recommending that you once again serve your former consumers, position using a nostalgic appeal, and utilizing several promotional techniques, because this will help you capture this market and really grow that brand and bring Pop Shop back to its loyal consumers. So we'd just like to thank you for having us. We really enjoyed it. And take this time to answer any questions you may have. So what would be that value proposition? You mentioned a couple times at the secondary market. What is the value proposition to that secondary market? Why would they the secondary market? Probably because they're their their parents, they loved it, right? So we're we're going on the fact that they're gonna be saying, Wow, I love this when I was young and so that those children would wanna like connect with them on with their parents on a whole other level. And also it's great, it's a great product, so we assume that they're gonna love it. <laughs> How do you think the part-time sales reps will be able to convince businesses to carry this product? Because it's obviously a competitive yeah. arena. So yeah, that's why we uh, initially recommend going into the candy shops and the themed restaurants because it won't be as competitive as you know, going into Walmart or something. It's very demanding for shelf space. So I figure having a regional sales rep really forming those close connections with these specialized stores, considering it is a, uh, a very different product, you know, and it'll help them add value to what they're giving their customers. So we think by really developing that relationship and highlighting the benefits of the product, that's why these special retailers will be convinced to. And I actually care. worked at a, like a small restaurant that we believe would be the fit for this product. And they actually go out, they don't have like the mass to go and buy, you know, cases of pop. They just go out and run to the store, buy a 12 pack or 24 pack and have it for the night of the week. So if we were bringing the product to them, those, those part-time sales reps, it would save them a lot of hassle and expense. So how many of these restaurants would a part-time sales rep have to hit up? To this? 
meals. It's only doing 12 to 24 at each restaurant. Like how many do they actually have to pay back in terms of a small volume like that? And is it capable of the half-time job books, the half-time sales rate? We projected that they could probably, like Ontario has a lot of, within the greater Toronto area, there's a lot of restaurants that would probably carry our brand. We think of around 100, and like off of the distribute, like the distributor was the same values across the board. So it's 100 each? Yeah. What kind of tools will that sentence would get the sales reps to sell to their customers? <laughs> Thanks. Uh, incentives to sale? Well, I believe we were basing it off a of salary, correct? $17 an hour, which is yeah. a lot higher. I mean, there's no consistent. Uh, we, we could factor in a commission long term, but I mean, initially, $17 an hour is like. Say we work with a, a mom who's going to be going into these restaurants between one and three, they can still go to their kids after school. Um, you know, seventeen dollars an hour is a lot more flex and it's a flexible job. It's a lot more than maybe working, you know, working at seven eleven or something else like that. Um, and obviously we want someone who's, you know, well aware of the marketplace, but um, I think the flexibility is, is the best part for them as a part time job. That, what I meant more so was what kind of incentives we provide their, their customers. So oh, you have know, like a consumer, you have know, a oh. customer, uh, the restaurants, candy shops, et cetera. Do you, have you thought of any, any kind of incentives that would help sell the product? Like and distribution to customers? Discounts and stuff like that. Um, well, it's not something we initially explored, just because we don't want to you know, start discounting the product away when we would like to explore the option of first trying to get it in at the uh, the wholesale price, but it is something, of course, you could uh, start a deal for you know so much purchased and so much off. But we were recommending a um, after a certain amount, throwing in the window displays and the promotional material for free, the complimentary with the purchase of the products. And also, we're planning to sell them at a dollar. So, and then we plan on them selling at around two fifty to three dollars. So the margin on their product is actually quite high. So maybe more profitable for them to carry it than other methods. Or whatever juices or whatever that are coker distributing. Okay. How do those margins compare to competitors? Do you guys look that up? Uh, yeah, well Pepsi and Coke, like their uh, initial like selling price to retailers wasn't really readily available, so we weren't really able to compare it directly. <laughs> and then how do you feel you're going with plastic versus glass and the original with glass? But you're in premium pricing, so do you think going with the plastic versus the glass will change any sort of position?